notice, those of you guys have been watching um, the last few videos, that I have really been railing and, 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 and laying into just the current government of Israel. Um, not only the current government of Israel, but you know, I, I think I mentioned that I read a, this book called Perfidy, which I guess the word means uh, betrayal or treachery. It was a book that was written in 1961, and the book was talking about uh, this, the famous story of Kastner, Rudolf Kastner. For those of you guys who don't know, I'm just going to give you the short version. He was a Hungarian Jew who basically, uh, you know, decided, you know, and he was working together with the Jewish Agency and the, and basically the Ben Gurion people, the Mapai Party, which later became Labor or is Labor, was Labor, uh, working together with them, and they were going to save, you know, I guess 600 of these elite Jews of Hungary and allow the Nazis to kill and gas and or gas about a million Jews of Hungary. And it was a big story in Israel and I and I was basically talking about it to draw parallels between that story and essentially what's happening today to where the government um, you know looks the other way towards certain things um, or away from certain things <clears throat> um, covers things up uh, silences people who speak out against certain things and what have you and um, I'll tell you guys I was just kind of joking with uh, some friends the other day that I that I right after finishing that book perfidy I actually <laughs> forced myself to read the book entitled the Prime Ministers because I don't, I don't know if you guys have read the book by Yehuda Avner and one of the Prime Ministers he worked for uh, was Menachem Begin and Menachem Begin was actually the the counterpart what I call a normal person um, you know it, as opposed to Ben Gurion and I read that book to basically dilute or temper my my seething anger <laughs> for the people who founded the state of Israel um, or the people who were in power after the declaration of the, you know, the independence of Yom Atzmaut of Israel in 1948. Um, but it's interesting, I was speaking to a friend of mine and they told me that, you know, and I told them, you know, it's interesting that my, my ticket back to Israel is for Yom Atzmaut, meaning I land, I actually am taking off as Hashem on Yom Azikoron, and I land just before nightfall in Israel just before Yom Atzmaut kicks in in Israel and it's, kind of, and it's quite symbolic and I was telling my friend I was debating whether or not I should fly that day because you know I, I just don't want to wear a bracelet and uh, you know all this kind of stuff I, you know I'm, ha I'm okay to quarantine I just really don't want to wear this bracelet situation right and um, and then I thought about it I really thought about it and, uh, and then today I was telling another friend of mine that, you know, I'm landing in Israel on the day that I, unlike many people, like I guess in the Orthodox or Torah observant community, that I will be saying uh, Hallel with a bracha on that day. Not only will I be saying Hallel with a bracha, I will take a haircut, just like I will take a haircut Zadashem this week, so that you guys see, like, Otherwise, I'll just be walking around like a dog for 33 days or however many days. Uh, but there's a few, there's some people in Israel who are, you know, the followers of the rough cook way, the rough cook path, who actually don't wait until <coughs> Lagba Omer to cut their hair, excuse me. Uh, but they actually cut their hair on uh, Yom Atzmaut because they understand that it's also a day of rejoicing. And there's a big debate, obviously, in the Orthodox community between people. People who are part of, I guess, one group who say, oh, you know, the founding of the state of Israel was actually a big tragedy and all these kind of things. And they don't, you know, they don't say hollow on that day. They don't say the Psalms on that day of uh, rejoicing. 
There are some people who say halal without a bracha, and there are people like myself, I'm part of the camp that actually says halal with a bracha, and also takes a haircut on that day. So I was just telling my friend that, I, you know, I'm going to take a haircut on that day. And I was saying that, you know, he, he was telling me that he has Haredi friends who are, you know, who call that day a day of uh, tragedy, whatever it is. And I said, listen, no, and he tells me, you know, he's Israeli and he says, yeah, it's just they have a different hashkafa, different philosophy. I'm like, they don't have a different philosophy. They just have a limited Torah. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. They have a limited philosophy. Because if we understand that, you know, the idea of Ein Od, od Milvado, there's nothing but a Shem. And we understand that if Hashem didn't want, believe you me, if Hashem didn't want the state of Israel to come into existence as an entity, he wouldn't have, it wouldn't have happened. My friends, you have, to, you have to know, there's nothing that happens in this world that Hashem does not sanction to happen. Now you get into discussions of free will and all these kind of things, but ultimately, you know, now you could say, well, what about the, what about the Shoah? What about the Holocaust, my friends? That is a very, very difficult and deep discussion to have, but yeah, listen. <laughs> so, if we understand that, then we understand that the state of Israel is part of the messianic process, and we have to take the good with the bad. We have to take everything in its totality. And I told my friend, you know, there were some things that were done that were not so savory. There were other things that were done that were, um, you know, that, that precipitated the founding of the state, you know, for example, all the actions that were done actually by this Menachem Begin and other groups, by Lehi, that essentially uh, caused the British to leave and for us to have independence, to the point where people like Ben Gurion, who were against these actions, joined in the fight. You guys can look this up, right? Um, so we have to see things in, in their totality. And my own, it's, it's funny, my own words made me think about this. Right? Not only that, everything that's been going on today, for example, with the, you know, with the vaccines and all the medical tyranny and all of the, you know, taking away people's freedoms and all the stuff that this, you know, Prime Minister has been doing, <clears throat> we have to see that there are good things that are coming out of it to where even if you say that the vaccines are whatever you think of them, whatever, you think they're effective, you think they're real, you think they're not placebo, you think they're, you know, I don't know, whatever they are, if nothing else, they are causing people to at least be in the mindset, or as I like to call, in the illusion of thinking that they are safe, or causing society to think that it's safe, and it's causing society to open up. So, you know, for people like myself who are not going to be taking the vaccine, it's only good because ultimately these people were going to were going to do what they do. They're going to, you know, uh, take the vaccine just to kind of uh, alleviate their own mishigas, right? Which I don't really have like they do, right? They're, they've been stirred up into a frenzy. They've been whipped up into fear. I'm, I'm not part of that whole mentality, right? It's only going to be good for me, ultimately, because, they, they, you know, the society will open up, the economy will open up. If you guys are saying, well, you know, but people who are not vaccinated will, will not be able to go to hear this, that, and the other. Guys, the thing is, even Prime Minister Netanyahu will tell you, we really only need to vaccinate 90 or 95% of the people to create something called herd immunity, or the, uh, the, the idea of herd immunity, or the perception of herd immunity, let's say that, right? So if they're able to get to that point, there's going to be that 5% of people who didn't vaccinate, right? Like myself and other people. And for whatever reason, whether it's just uh, out of principle or just, you know, I, I mean, in my case, I have actually like certain allergies and autoimmune stuff going on, okay? So eventually, once we reach your herd immunity, this, you know, the state, the government, I would like to think, I would like to think, would actually get rid of these policies would get rid of these green pass policies and all these other policies, right? Uh, one would hope. I don't know. Um, that's that's my that's my line of thinking. Those of you guys are saying, well, it's only going to get worse. Well, listen. If you're one of these people who are, is really in favor of the vaccines and is pushing other people to get the vaccines, and you're also saying that it's only going to get worse, that the government's only going to clamp down more and more and more, then 
your uh, assertion that the vaccine is effective is total BS. Because if the vaccine is effective, then there's no need for the government to clamp down more and more and more because the vaccine is effective. It will have done its job. It eventually will do its job. We will have achieved some, you know, modicum of whatever, 90, 95%, supposedly, you know, like uh, according to your logic, 95% herd immunity. So there's no need for the rest of the 5% to take vaccines. You're not trying to get 100% vaccine vaccination, uh, you know, level. That's not the goal here. The goal here is 90, 95%, right? That's what they say. That's what the Prime Minister says, that's what the CEO of Pfizer says. I mean, uh, these are their words, not mine, right? That's what scientists say, that's what doctors say, whatever. Okay? So, I look at things in their totality, you know? Baal Shem Tov used to, used to say, the world that was created for you. What does that mean? It doesn't mean, you know, it's not a statement of, uh, what is it, narcissism or self-centeredness. It's a statement that the more you believe in Hashem, the more you trust in Hashem, the more Hashem will move literally mountains, will orchestrate, you know, what I like, what people like to call the, 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 the butterfly effect or the chaos theory, the more Hashem will orchestrate all of the chess pieces to go in your favor. Meaning that the more someone really believes in Hashem and believes Hashem is going to help them, the more that Hashem literally will orchestrate an entire machinery of an entire country, an entire population, an entire you know, airport and, 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 I don't know, government office, whatever it is, for that person to be able to, you know, for everything to go smoothly for that individual. I'm telling you, I'm only telling you guys this because I found this to be true with myself. Anything to do with Israel, like leaving Israel, coming into Israel, being in Israel, living in Israel, I'm telling you guys, it's the land of Emunah. And a person who really, really works on that, and a person really, really lives on that, you know, in that space, and works to li to be on that level. Listen, I'm, guys, I'm not I'm not sitting here preaching, telling you that I'm, you know, the Lubavitch Rebbe or or Baba Sali or anything like that. But I try, not like them. I try to be on some level and to understand that Hashem is just going to orchestrate things in a way to open up, you know, to to move mountains and to and to split seas or split the sea in every single situation. And I've seen this many, many times. I've seen it. And a lot of people tell me, you know, even people who are like, you know, so to speak, religious, and some of them live in Israel. Well, Tzvi, you know, we'd like to live that way, but it's, you know, I had a friend literally tell me, you know, I can't live on, you know, we're talking about people, you know, Aliyah, people want to make Aliyah from America. And I had a lot of my friends tell me, well, what do you want? What do you want us to do? You know, we need parnasa. We need. Okay, I get it. You need parnasa. You need. You have to sustain yourself. These people have like families. You know, they have kids. And I had one person tell me, well, we can't just live on Amuna cookies. You know, like, <laughs> like uh, just believe in Hashem and Hashem is gonna rain mana down on your head. I'll tell you something. It's not quite like that, but it's one of those things. If you say, if you make a Pact with Hashem. If you make a deal with Hashem and you say, "Listen, we're going to Israel," or you're an individual and you say, "I'm going to Israel. I want to make a life in Israel." I'm telling you guys, Hashem opens doors for you. Hashem really, really opens doors for you. He doesn't. He doesn't rain down mana on your head. He gives you opportunities. And you could say, "Well, what about the people who made Yerida, who also believed in Hashem?" and this and that and the other. I'll tell you guys something, when I talk to those people, actually, when you get down to the nitty gritty, and I hate to say this, when you really get down to the nitty gritty, upon, you know, as they say in the NFL, the referees, upon further review, <laughs> the call on the field is overturned. You know what I'm saying? You talk to them and you realize that, no, you, you know, they, 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 their mentality was always, you know, they came to Israel to see if it would work, and if it didn't work, they told me that they always knew that they can go back to America and get a job in America or whatever it is, or figure things out in America. My friends, there's an idea in Jewish philosophy that wherever you direct your ratzon, wherever you direct your will, that is where Hashem is going to take you. It even includes Averot, it even includes if, if a person wants to sin, Hashem actually, contrary to what you guys might think, like contrary to, uh, uh, what is it called, conventional thinking, Hashem will literally open the doors for you to sin. 
Hashem will take you wherever your will wants to go. So if you are a person or if you're a family that says, we're going to go to, we're going to Israel and we want to make it and we want to stay there and there's no plan B and there's no, there's no plan B. There's nothing to fall back on. You know, I, I always tell this to people. I'm saying, if you want to move to Israel, have the mentality that you're moving to Mars and that the, the spacecraft that's taking you to Mars is a one way uh, craft, meaning it lands on, the, on Mars and there's no, no more fuel for that, that craft to go back. Now, it's one thing if you want to visit America, whatever it is, your family, but I'm just talking about in terms of living and coming back. It's a one way mentality. You have to have that. And if you have that, I guarantee you, Hashem is going to open doors for you. I guarantee you. If you have the mentality, well, I can always come back, it doesn't work out, there's always this, there's always that, we don't know, da da da, it's comfortable here, it's comfortable there, we don't know. I'm telling you guys, there's o you can't have a, what's called a split ratzon. And if you guys don't believe me, you're thinking I'm talking out of, uh, you know, these kind of fanciful, you know, I don't know what you call yeshiva ideas, you guys should go and you should look at, um, you guys should go on YouTube and look up Eddie Murphy's appearance on Inside the Actor Studio. I don't know if you guys know the guy, James Lipton. I'm not sure if the guy's still alive. He's probably very old if he didn't pass away. It's a guy. He interviews. Um, he used to interview big celebrities, and it was it was in a in the in the school of I think it's a school of fine arts or something like that. It's in it's in the, the city in Manhattan, in City College. And one of the interviews he did an interview of Eddie Murphy, and he asked Eddie Murphy. He asked Eddie, "When did you know you wanted to be a comedian?" Eddie Murphy said. James, I, you know, I first got on stage when I was 13 years, uh, I'm sorry, 15 years old. I got up on stage and, uh, you know, after the first, first few shows, I realized that I was good at this stuff. I got laughs. I realized I wasn't natural. And I said to myself, you know, and, he, and he's talking at the audience and he said to them, guys, uh, the best advice I can give you is don't have a plan B. You know, you see a lot of people, they have a plan B. Well, if this acting thing doesn't work out, or if this thing doesn't work out, I'm going to, uh, you know, I have this to fall back on. I have a degree, I have this, I have that. You hear, a lot, you hear that a lot, the, th the fall back on thing. And, and he says, the problem with that mentality is that there's always that little thing in the back of your mind that's allowing you to not fully go for the gusto. It actually is allowing you and setting you up for failure in your plan A. Because you know you have a plan B to fall back on. Therefore, if all you have is plan A, then what will happen is, you go, he says, human psychology is such that you'll only go for plan A, you're gonna put all your energy into plan A, and all your gusto, and all your ratso, and all your will, and he calls it the universe, but I, you know, Judaism says that Hashem is going to actually move mountains for you to, for, for plan A to pan out. That is how it works. That is how energy works. This is what he said. And my friends, the same thing can be applied for uh, not only like, you know, making Aliyah and living in Israel and staying in Israel, but also what I just described to you guys, where to where Baal Shem Tov was talking about, to where you know the world is created for you. Meaning, Hashem can literally move entire the machinations of entire in, you know inner workings of a, of a country just to help a person actualize what they want to actualize, or help a person you know with a smooth uh, you know if, if a person has to come back you know uh, and travel and get into the country and get, you know, I don't know, get in a taxi and get home or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> have their documents accepted by the right person. It's kind of like when I first met Eliyah, I had a friend tell me, you know, with all these offices in Israel, whenever you go, wherever you go, the key to the whole equation is, it's who you know. Not only who you know, but who, in Russian it says, Kto, kto who you get in your lap, who you get, you know? Who handles, who's the person that handles your document? Is the person going to look at the document and say, this document is okay? You know, there could be two people looking at the same document. One person can say, this is not okay, come back. Or this is, uh, you know, you need to go to this other office. Another person can say, okay, this is fine. 
uh, you know, and uh, you know, or call his superior and say, okay, we accept this document. It really, my friends, all depends on who's looking at the document, who is handling your case. It really all depends. You know, where they where they uh, got up on that, what what side of the bed they got up that morning. You know, did they just get hired? Uh, how their boss spoke to them, and my friends, um, depending on how you, I guess align your will to what you want Hashem is gonna help you I'm telling you guys I'm only saying this from experiential perspective I'm not saying this as some cute thing to say that some rabbi told me to say or that I read in a book I mean uh, these things are corroborated but in books but I'm, I'm, I'm corroborating you these things from my personal life I'm telling you guys it's been a it's been a 10-year journey on and off with Israel and I'm telling you guys I, I, I can confirm what I just told you with you know stories of my own and other people's stories you know we call them only in, only in Israel stories you guys can go on Facebook literally there's a group called only in Israel and you can hear story after story after story after story after story you know through the eye of the needle and this is how people live and you guys can say well I can't live like that so don't live like that okay listen guys at the end of the day I think it was even Einstein who said there's one of two ways to look at life, to live life. Uh, one way is as, as if nothing is a miracle. The second way is as if everything's a miracle. That's not to say you have to rely on miracles. You have to do your hishtadlut, your, your effort. But even your hishtadlut, the result of which sometimes is so improbable that it could be considered a miracle. Yes. That's basically it, guys. That's really basically it, you know? So so I'll tell you guys, I had um, a team, somebody I consider a teacher, he told me recently, when I, again, when I was railing against the government, he told me, you know, Tzvi, do not let this thing, he's like, I totally agree with you, I understand that you're upset, I understand that you have certain values, you value your freedom and liberty, and you have principles and you, you don't want to wear this thing on your arm out of principle and you don't want to do this out of principle I get it but he goes ultimately man you have to think about what are you willing to trade are you willing to trade two weeks of sitting in your house uh, with a with a bracelet for the uh, you know the ability and the and the and the and the schut and the merit to be in the land of Israel and to connect to Hashem on a more elevated plane, you know, and I'm and I'm I'm just extrapolating his words here. What he, what he means to say is, at the end of the day, guys, Israel's just not just any other country to where you know somebody took away your freedoms and you're making a you know a conscientious uh, objection and you're not going to come home until they until they change the situation. Um, you know, this for me, it's not about going to restaurants, it's not about going to theaters, it's not about that or this or the other. It's about accessing the very unique and otherwise inaccessible Kedusha that only the land of Israel has to offer and 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 my teacher in this case told me do not let these impediments on freedom or your kind of uh, you know view on these things impede you from the ability to access the Kedusha because he, at the end of the day he said in, in your case even if you're in your apartment for two weeks and even if you come out of quarantine, you don't take the vaccine, and you're walking around outside, or you eat somewhere outside, or wherever you go, there's a lot of places you can go where you don't need the green pass, and you are constantly accessing Kedusha, and you're living in an elevated space, in an elevated place, really, and an elevated life. And don't let these things impede you from doing that. And I told, and I'm, I'm telling you guys, if it wasn't, if it was any other country, I probably would stick to my guns, and I would say, you know what? Screw these people. I'm not going to wear their damn bracelet, and I'm not going to do this. And I'm not going, you know, whatever it is. I'm, like, I'm not going to be a pariah. But I'll tell you guys something. I had another teacher of mine tell me, you know, at the end of the day, man, and he he went even more extreme. He goes, you're supposed to. Our, our sages explain, you're supposed to die for Arabs as royal, right? In this case, I'm not going to. Has for shalom you know you're being asked to wear a bracelet so with that said my friends with regard to the bracelet with regard to the bracelet here's the thing you know I always say um, this government needs to be careful what they wish they wish for uh, 
you know, I'm going to wear the bracelet. I'm going to come home and I'm going to wear the bracelet. Let's put it that way. And that's all I'm going to say for now. I'll wear the bracelet. But, you know, this government is going to come to the conclusion that making Tzvi, the editor of the Nation of Israel, wear the bracelet uh, was probably not such a wise decision for them to uh, take. I'm just going to leave it at that. No violence, no nothing, but, you know, guys, um, for all the people, I'm going to put it to you guys like this, for all the people that I saw who uh, had their pictures taken with the bracelet, who had interviews done at the airport with the bracelet, um, you know, the world hasn't seen anything yet. I'll leave it at that, guys. All right. So, here's to seeing the big picture. Here's to Yom Ma'ud coming up next month. Independence. Here's to uh, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Here's to freedom, but also here's to being able to have the seichel and the, and the, and the understanding that there's something, uh, I guess, bigger here at play. And sometimes we have to, I guess, lose the small battles or lose the battles in order to win the war. You know guys, I was a trader on Wall Street and sometimes in order to make money you have to uh, know how to lose properly, right? You have to know how to take a small loss. And I'll tell you guys, this bracelet situation, as much as I'm not a fan of it, in the grand scheme of things, I'm gonna take it as a small loss. You know, as we say on Wall Street, I'm gonna hit out. You know, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a penny or two loss. But, they'll see. In the next trade, I'm gonna catch a point. You know, I'm gonna catch a dollar move, and uh, that'll be that. All right, guys. Talk to you soon.